start off with, you know. <laughs> okay, you don't know. There are times when I just want to slap my mother. That's right. She's dead, so I can say that. There are times I just want to slap my mother, because you know what? She raised me wrong. By golly. Sometimes, you know, I think about some of the things she tried to teach me, you know, and the things she taught me, and the things that I do, and I think, man, you know what? I just want to slap her for making me what I am. Huh. You know, most people, I thought, because they had a mother and a father, you know, were taught to respect their elders. You know, people in authority, you know, like police officers and um, judges and, you know, anyone that's really got authority over you, you know, like the President of the United States. Oops, I shouldn't mention him. There might be a Democrat around or a Republican or somebody that wants to say he's not an American. Right. Okay. Like I said, I don't know. I think I ought to just slap my mother across the face. But you taught me that the Bible said that God puts people in authority, you know? Okay, maybe she didn't teach me that. Maybe I learned that on my own. But she did teach me that, you know, I was supposed to respect people that were in charge. Now, I may not always agree with them. They may make wrong decisions at times, and my lifetime, I've seen some bad decisions people have made. And frankly, I've seen some of the bad decisions I've made. But you know, some of the decisions I make, like today when I posted this opportunity to talk about prayer and focusing in on Jesus, I'm kind of happy with that decision to do that. Because you see, it gave me a chance to take something that people get all blown out of proportion and see if they're going to focus in on Jesus or they're going to focus in on distraction. And sure enough, because God told me to do it, different people revealed their hearts. Some of them liked what was said because it talked about, look, I don't care you know, what a person's personal opinion about somebody is. I only care about what a person tells me. If you come up and tell me you're a Christian, I'll say, okay, you know, and I'll leave it between you and God, but I'll stand back and I'll kind of watch and see, you know, pray for you, you know, pray for you like I would anybody else. Because, you see, I pray for the president, I pray for the Senate, I pray for judiciary, I pray for everybody, you know, it's kind of like, you know, God, save them all, you know, God, work on them, you know, do something with them, but, you know, just don't put them in my life because, you know, then I have to go and witness to them, you know, and share with them and love them, you know. As long as they're kind of far away, I can just pray for them, you know. But I sure can't open my mouth and hate them, you know, or lie about them or tell gross exaggerations about them. You know, kind of like what people do about President Obama, you know, and have done with pastors and elders and other people that they don't like. You know, they make up all these bad rumors or these exaggerated statements and then they go build a website over it and try to make themselves famous because they're slamming someone and the only thing they got to say is something negative because they don't have anything nice to say about anything. You ever notice that? You ever notice how sometimes these things get snowballed and out of proportion where suddenly you started off with, you know, maybe disagreeing and then you're the one who's like exaggerating telling lies, making untrue statements, bearing false witness, becoming anti-Christian. Because, you know, you're with a group that calls themselves Christian, but now you're acting like the person you're accusing. You don't have that fruit of the Spirit in your life. You don't love or trust God. Because you're too busy with advocating your personal opinion on everyone else. I kind of like what I did today, you know? Because it kind of inspired me and... Oh, I know. I'll bet you're wondering what this is. So am I. <laughs> it's, uh... Smells okay. Tastes okay. I've eaten some of it, so... I haven't thrown up yet, so I think it's alright. I think it's good for me. Looks like some rice in there, and I think it's rice aroni. Rice aroni, the San Francisco tree. Some tomatoes, and no bugs. 
looks like uh, cilantro and some uh, guacamole. Actually, it tastes good. So I kind of mixed it all together, you know, kind of like what the body of Christ is like. You know, some people are rice, some people are tomatoes, which some people call a tomato a vegetable, which it isn't, it's a fruit. But you see, that's kind of what people do with Christians that they want to be in charge of. They call them not a Christian when they are, because they want to be in charge of how God is dealing with them. Now, the fact that a person goes to a church doesn't make them a, church, a Christian any more than going into McDonald's makes them a burger, but it doesn't make them not become a Christian either. You see, you don't judge a person by the church, and you don't judge a church by the person. God looks at the heart, man looks on the outward thing. So if you want to be with God, you go ask him what he sees. Because if you're looking with what you see, you don't see what I see. Because me, I'd take some of you, I'd stick you in a bowl like this and stir it up, and I'd eat you. You know why? Because you got to learn how to get along. God wants you to actually taste good. He wants to see what you taste like, what the life you live tastes like. Because he wants to know if your his son is in you. Because according to the scripture, it says, taste and see that the Lord is good. So if there's any good in you, he could taste it and see that the Lord is in you. Now, I'll admit, if I leave this out all day, you won't smell like it smells today. But if I eat it now, it's going to help me out for the day. Because for me, right now, it tastes good. Oh, I may have to pour in some ketchup, you know, smother it in ketchup so that way grace supplies, you know, because believe me, when it tastes bad, ketchup works. Then you could eat anything. Ask any bachelor <laughs> that doesn't know how to cook. But this tastes good because the blending together of all the ingredients causes all my taste buds to pick up the cilantro, the rice. It's chicken flavored rice, so it tastes good. So I pick up the chicken, taste a little bit of pepper, a little bit of salt. Can smell a fragrance, kind of a cilantro smell. Kind of makes me think that I'm eating cilantro, which really I can't see much of it, so. There it is, cilantro. Love cilantro. Kind of got that aftertaste that has definitely guacamole in it. So, mixed all together, I like it. Now, I had them sitting in the refrigerator, and I looked at them, and I said, no, I don't want any more of that, you know, guacamole. And I said, I don't want any more of that, you know, tomato mix, you know. I said, I don't want any more of that rice. But I thought, you know, I ought to eat it, because, you know, it's like getting bad in the refrigerator. So let me mix it up, and I'll eat it. Did you know that God wants to do that with you? He wants to mix you up at times, so that he can get a quality flavor out of you, so that you will just act good, but you'll smell good, you'll look good, and you'll taste good. That's why he mixes things up sometimes in your life. To mix you in a bowl and decide maybe I need to go check that person out. I need to see if they're bearing any fruit and what it tastes like. Let me go see what they're doing in their life. Let me go see what they're saying in their life. Let me go see what's going on on the inside that nobody knows that I can see. Because kind of worried about that person. They haven't been mixing it up with anybody else. They've just been sitting on their own theology, sitting in their own little corner of the world, feeling like they're righteous and no one else is. Well, they make good rice. So I'm getting tired of rice. I want something else, so I think I'll take them out of their circumstances and put them in the bowl, and now I'm going to mix it up for them. You get the analogy? I hope so, because it's a great metaphor. God does that a lot. Now, maybe he doesn't do it with you. 
But he certainly does it with me, and I sure get to eat a lot of variety of food. Adorn the doctrine of God, our salvation, in all things. Let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Abstain from all appearance of evil. If you be reproached for the name of Jesus, happy are you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Busybody? Who? Me? No. I don't get involved in the president's affairs after all. I'm in charge, so I know that I can go help him out. Oh, I don't get involved in, you know, like those affairs in Congress because I know that, you know, I could get everybody in the world involved and we could all petition and get really nitty-gritty down to it and really worry about... Let's see, what are we worried about? We're a busybody, but we're... Let's see. If we be reproached for the name of Jesus, happy are you, but let none of you suffer as a busybody or an evildoer. So... Wait a minute, we're supposed to adorn the doctrine of our God in all things and abstain from all appearance of evil for what? As becomes the gospel of Jesus. Now, come on. You don't want to tell me that I can't go get involved in political affairs, do you? Sure. If you want to share the gospel. You mean I have to go and share Jesus with somebody? Like, you know, those people that I'm trying to convince to work with me in democracy so that way I can get all politically activated, you know, and I can get really mad at those other guys that aren't with us because if they're not with us, then they're the bad guys, you know, and I can start saying all manner of things against them and get involved in their affairs to say that they're messing up the country, you know. Sure. Then you can be known for the gospel you share. What gospel are you sharing again? Hmm. What is your purpose in life? I wonder. I do. I wonder. Are you adorning the doctrine of God? Or are you hmm, dressing it up in your own makeshift way? Kind of like a Barbie and putting a new kind of way of wearing certain clothes that you think ought to fit. Be blameless. Oops! Guilty! Well, not guilty, blameless. Be harmless. Whoops! I haven't caused any harm. Really? No, I didn't do it. Not me, man. I didn't cause that person to stumble because I was out there, you know, yelling at the president, yelling at this, and yelling at that, and telling everybody to do this and do that, and be distracted so that they never get the gospel, they never even get a chance to be witness to, they never even get a chance to find God, but they go to hell, you know, and they suffer, and they're suffering there, and I look down and I say, man, if there was ever anything I could have done, why didn't I do it? And you know full well, well why you didn't do it, because you're too busy doing something else that you did, and you didn't join the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is what he sent you to do in the first place, so that way you would go out there and busybodying about somebody else, and something else that you didn't been busybodying about in the first place. In other words, you've been pecking the ground when you should have been flying in the sky. I mean, if you really want to be a chicken in a chicken coop, hey, you can just peck away, because that's what you are. You're a little pecker. Yep, that's what you are. You're a little pecker. You're just scratching the ground. You're just pecking at the ground. You're just, you know, like, clucking and chucking and just, you know, stomping around and clucking and scratching the ground. And if you've ever seen a chicken in a chicken coop, that ain't much of a life. So be blameless. Be harmless. The sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom you shine as lights in the world. You don't go out and tell people what's wrong with them. You go out and tell them to get Jesus. You don't go out and tell people what's wrong with the lights. Now that's a fluorescent, and that's a spotlight. I'm sorry, but you know what, spotlight? You're wrong. The fluorescent's right. Hello. And then we've got more. we got neon. we got freon. we got... <laughs> Uh, what do they call it? I can't even think what the new bulbs are called. You know, the little light ups that, you know, gradually they get brighter and brighter and brighter. But don't throw one away. Dangerous. Hazmat. <laughs> so you see, if you don't know what you're here for, then you don't know what you're supposed to do. Then you're going to get involved in all kinds of things that you shouldn't have been doing in the first place because you're a busybody. And you know whether you're busy or not because you know what you're busy about. And no offense to some of you, 
But uh, I see you on the internet, and you see me. I don't know what you post, but you know what I post. And maybe I do know what you post, and it's Post Toasties. Because you see, Post Toasties is what it's going to be like after the tribulation period. Nothing will remain. Nothing. Because God's wrath came along. He wiped all out man's inventions, ideas, theories, and everything else. So if you're really worried about one or two years, it's post toasties. It's nothing to worry about. Soon, and very soon, we're going to see the king. The king is coming. He's going to set up his kingdom. In the meantime, right before he gets here, everything's annihilated. It's wiped out. You know, pretty much devastated. Completely wiped all the way down to nothing. So that he has something to work with. Because no offense, anything you're looking around at isn't worth working with. And so if you think that democracy is something, where do you get in the kingdom? Because there ain't no democracy there. <laughs> so don't get caught up in busybody this and busybody that. Get caught up in the sons of God. That which is meant to be light shining in a perverse of connection. Not consumed with trying to change and save the nation. Because it's going to hell in a handbasket. Let's be real. There is no such thing as some glorious prophecy for America to enter into the thousand-year millennium and become the king of all nations. I don't think so. And it's not going to happen. Sorry, just won't happen. Mash the planet back together, make it one continent, then take a look at where we were. You might figure out where we are. You might kind of get a handle on what we are. Uh, do you really want to know? Ooh. Compare it to the nations. Kind of take Israel's central point, you know, and kind of start working from there and then mash the continents back together. They've done modules like this, and I did that in my books, Thousand Year Reign. I mean, The Thousand Years, and then the Genesis Age, Exodus Age, The Vintage, uh, all the books that I wrote. So anyways, did that, match it all together, and said, oh, wow. When you put this module together and you see all the continents that come together based upon the shift, you know, the planetary shifts, the crust, you know, where they align up and how the continents come back together and you put them together and see, you go, there's Israel, there's, ooh, there's America. Okay. Hmm. We're not in prophecy, but <laughs> I know what we are. <laughs> ooh, boy. So, I don't know, maybe that's a hint for you to study. Of course, if you're studying that, wouldn't it be better to study how to share and care and dare to be sons of God and witnesses for the gospel's sake, to adorn, as it were, the doctrine of God, of Jesus, our Savior, in all things. How do you adorn something? How do you decorate? How do you decorate your life with the gospel? How do you make it a part of every moment of your day? How do you make it a part of everything that you do and say? How do you make it a part of something that you do, that you say you want to become, like a Jesus fanatic? Or do you? Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. I don't know, but when people are tearing things down, I don't see anybody saying, you know, I can tell that's a Christian because he sounds like one, he looks like one, and I just give credit to God for what he's done with that man because he's so good at tearing down the president, the government, democracy, conspiracy. He's so good at saying everything's so wrong. I'll bet God really is, you know, God of wrath. Because I don't see any God of love that coming out of that man. I see a God of wrath. And I see hellfire and no way that there could be a heaven for anyone. Because he's full of brimstone. See what you're doing? I hope so. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Oops. Dirty word for some people. Mercy. No, we don't give mercy to the president. I'm sorry. You just can't give mercy to anyone. If you start giving it to somebody like President Obama, you're going to have to give it to everyone. You might have to be merciful to God. You know, not those terrorists. You know, we don't love the world. You know, we hate the world. We hate the terrorists. Don't be merciful to them. You know, God knows what will happen. You know, they might get saved. We don't want that. Do we? Don't be merciful to, you know, somebody that just wronged you. You know, by golly, you know, you, you wronged me. And you know what? I'm not forgiving you. Not seven times, not 70 times seven. No matter how many times you come to me, I am not going to forgive you. Because I don't want to be forgiven. Just 
just clucking and chucking, just pecking the ground, you little pecker. <laughs> Scratch it. Looking for CD. Because, see, that's what you're doing. You're stealing the seed that is meant to germinate in someone's life to become the Word of God in them so that they would become alive unto the Spirit of God as His Word becomes a portion into their experiences by circumstances that He waters them with by the love of God that is shed abroad on their heart so that it could begin to grow and sprout. But no, there's always someone coming along scratching at the ground for that seed, pecking at the ground to find it choosing to take that word of God, that little bit of love, that little bit of mercy, a little bit of forgiveness, that little bit of kindness, a little bit of gentleness, a little bit of compassion that one single soul needed to be saved. And who did it? Who did it? Not I. What are you adorning your life with? What kind of clothes are you wearing? The robes of righteousness? Of self-righteousness? Or of mercy and grace? You see, mercy and grace is someone who will take off their robe of righteousness Mercy and grace is the willingness to lay down our life for the sake of one another. Mercy and grace is willing to say, I give my life that I might live unto you and share with you the glory of my Savior Jesus who died for me and gave his life for me. So now I want to share with you that life that he gave me and I want to help you along the way. I don't want to beat you. I don't want to chastise you. I don't want to correct you. I want to love you. I want to clothe you in robes of righteousness. I want to take the best that I have and give it to you so that you can wear it and we could be together in heaven as one. What are you adorning the gospel with? What type of adornment, decorations have you put on your presentation of Jesus? Bind them about thy neck and write them upon the table of thine heart so shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and in the sight of man. Mercy and grace has taken me farther than all the wisdom that I have and believe me I have knowledge that goes next. And it got me nowhere. I spent years of study and sure I could argue today with any theologian it was fun. Intellectually it accomplished nothing. But you know I talk about the love of God. I talk about how Jesus loves me and forgives me and just how tender he is and how I can talk to him and how sometimes he's sitting right here and so real that it's like wow Lord, you want me to do what? Oh, man, thank you. And people are amazed. You talk to God? God loves you? Somebody like you he loves? And they are impacted. They are ministered to. They are shared with. I had a recent just experience that someone wrote a compliment to me. <laughs> Complimented me? <laughs> it's his. But the point being, compliment said, you know, I am so glad to wake up in the morning and to just see the ministry that you're doing, you know, and the grace and the mercy and the kindness and all that stuff, you know, that you're sharing and you're, you're promoting and talking about God because that's what I really needed because, you know, everybody's beat up, you know, and I don't need that. And I thought, because for such as I was there, but the grace of God go I, I could be just as easily caught up into that. But I chose not to, and I choose not to, and we won't do that in video, and we won't do that in this ministry ever. Because we would rather see you find Jesus, no matter how it does, how you do it, how, what it takes. We become anything foolish, stupid, you know, eating breakfast, throwing our coats down, laying on the ground, whatever. <laughs> doing this, doing that, you know, doing this, doing that, you know. Whatever it takes so that you would know 
the love that God has for you. I mean, the real love, not just this philosophical idea about, well, I think I know what love is because, you know, it feels good. No, the love that encompasses you when you don't feel good. The love that goes beyond you when you don't feel like you're loved. The love that takes you all the way to heaven. Literally. Because that's what the love of God does. It causes men to draw, draweth men to repentance. And they repent and they turn to God and they are pulled to God by that love that's in them. Because that is God. God is love. Brethren, what's all the things are true? What's over things are honest? What's over things are just? What's over things are pure? What's over things are lovely? What's over things are good report? If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. I have to admit, when I got crucified for sharing that all I want to do is share Jesus and I really don't want to debate, argue, and chastise anyone. I was taking a task. Because of the person that I used to exemplify that. Because we know we have our own little people we don't want salvation for. We have our own little people that we say they aren't saved. Of course, we're telling the world that when we go on the internet and we proclaim who we are by our words and posts. So if you want to learn something from God about how your words impact the lives and you don't want to be a little pecker scratching out the seed of God as it's being shed abroad in the hearts and lives of people that are on the internet, then may I say to you, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are holy, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, if there be any of these things that you know that should not be adorning to the gospel of Jesus Christ, then don't put it on the internet. Don't post it. Don't be a part of it. Don't put your name on it. Because you're building a reputation that's permanent. Everything on Facebook, everything on the internet is permanent. People have it somewhere on their computer. And you know, if that scares you, then you should know that God has it permanent in his book of life. And he sees it and has known it all along. So, could you kind of like zip it the lip it? You know? Unless you have something to say about Jesus. Because, man, if you've got something to say about Jesus, you've got my attention. <laughs>